Hi, I'm Brendan Spellacy, co-founder and CEO at Patch, and you're listening to the Rise Fintech Podcast, brought to you by Barclays. Hello, and welcome to the Rise Fintech Podcast. I'm your host, Alex George, Fintech Platform Manager at Rise, created by Barclays. Rise is a global community of entrepreneurs and innovators working together with Barclays to create the future of financial services. In this podcast, we meet fintechs and industry experts to hear about the future of banking straight from the mouths of the innovators who are transforming the industry. This quarter's insights report will focus on the topic of climate fintech and feature Patch, a platform for negative emissions. On today's podcast, we will dive into the topic with Brennan Spellacy, co-founder and CEO at Patch, and talk about the opportunities at the intersection of fintech and climate, Patch's solutions for cryptocurrencies environmental problems, the role of negative emission tech, Brendan's entrepreneurial journey, and top advice for entrepreneurs. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conversation. Brennan, thank you so much for joining our episode today. To start, can you tell the audience a bit more about Patch and what led you to start the company? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my co-founder and I Aaron Grunfeld started Patch about a year ago to build essentially an API that takes CO2 out of the air. The way we got there goes all the way back to my undergrad. I initially studied chemical engineering at McGill with the intention of working in renewable energy. So I've always wanted to mitigate climate change in one way or another and thought I was going to be designing utility scale renewable energy systems. When I graduated, I actually only got jobs in oil and gas, which was the opposite of what I wanted to do. And so I decided to do a little bit of a career pivot and become a programmer. From there, I worked at Shopify and then a small hospitality startup called Flatbook, which I'm known as Sonder. And it wasn't until April of 2020 that Aaron and I decided we wanted to leave Sonder and start a company of our own. And... The most important thing for me, especially when you're starting a company, was I wanted to make sure I brought it back to climate in one way or another. The unfortunate reality is that we're not really on the right track when it comes to climate change, and the problem becomes more and more urgent as each day goes by. And the way we thought about building Patch was there's two major buckets uh, or two major levers that you can mitigate climate change with. The decarbonization lever, so that's rolling out new renewable energy, investing in maybe new battery technology, developing or new ways to recycle new materials so you can consume less. And then there's the idea of carbon removal. So how do you actually take CO2 or carbon out of the carbon cycle and store it in some sort of stable form? We felt as a team that basically, although there was still an immense amount of work to be done on the decarbonization bucket, uh, where you know most climate models having us need to remove, decarbonize around 80% um, globally by 2050, um, that the snowball had kind of begun to accumulate a little bit, whether it's Tesla is making EVs um, commonplace and GM kind of having plans to have all electric vehicles in the next, I think, five or 10 years, or whether it's the levelized cost of energy, of renewables, web, beating out coal and even um, natural gas in some geographies, versus the carbon removal bucket, where we aren't even doing a hundredth of the capacity globally we need to be doing today in order to hit that net zero goal. And so Patch is really an attempt to catalyze the growth of both carbon markets and carbon removal as a whole to make it incredibly easy, both for businesses and individuals to start contributing to this piece of the equation. One of the sectors that Patch is currently focused on is fintech. Uh, Many consumers don't naturally equate financial services and environmental impact, similar to your career journey um, once you graduated from McGill. So why did Patch um, focus on this sector and um, what was really driving the adoption? Is it more consumer demand or regulatory requirements and corporate sustainability teams? Yeah, absolutely. So great question. And at first blush, it totally is. It isn't totally intuitive. That being said, if you zoom out and think about how the world it is the way it is, a lot of it is because of how money moves. So whether that's who gets specific loans or how money gets spent with which specific types of businesses, all this spending behavior actually has some sort of environmental impact. And so when it came down to how do we get the most leverage as a business at Patch to have the widest environmental impact going to financial institutions, whether that's uh, retail banking or investment banking or even private equity, made a lot of sense for us, where you can actually see a huge amount of how the money is actually flowing, come up with some sort of environmental impact associated, associated with that, and then begin to mitigate that impact. Um, And then as far as who the driving forces, whether it's um, consumer demand, regulatory demand, et cetera, 
I'm actually seeing it's, it's twofold. So first you have this bottoms up motion where you have millennials and Gen Z being the first two generations that are going to be materially affected by climate change in their lifetime. These are also two of the most, what I would describe as value aligned shoppers or spenders in that people shop with a specific brand because they believe it's a reflection of their value system. Now, when you combine these two things together, uh, it, you basically get this perfect storm of young people effectively wanting climate forward, in addition to other um, movements like, like social good, climate forward solutions built into their financial products. Uh, and then the second driving force is actually less related to regulatory, at least as far as past just seen, is actually more related to investor pressure. So again, who's actually investing in these businesses? And that's coming from the perspective of these investors, if they're operating on a 5, 10, 15 year horizon, if you're like a private equity fund or something like that, see this macro movement within millennials and Gen Z. And they actually understand that in order for their businesses to get either the best return on investment or, you know, there is a degree of altruism involved. I um, tend to be a little bit more pessimistic, quite frankly, and believe that kind of these more macro forces tend to be a little bit more powerful. Um, they see these kind of trends, especially with the younger generations that are going to eventually be the majority of spend in the next five or 10 years. And they actually put pressure on their businesses to act accordingly. So within the fintech sector, Patch has done a lot of research and work with cryptocurrency companies to help them accelerate their carbon removal. Um, with the recent Coinbase IPO, commercializations of NFTs, and just you know an overall kind of crypto craze, how are you helping these companies address their energy-intensive processes and carbon impact? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, I think there's been a ton of coverage associated with crypto's negative environmental impact. Um, I don't actually believe that's totally fair, especially when you compare it to institutional financial um, financial bodies, whether it's Know, traditional investment banks, et cetera. I mean, you know, you have like the JP Morgan's of the world putting uh, billions of dollars into oil and gas. And so I think crypto gets a little bit scapegoated because it's the new kid on the block, quite truthfully. Um, and it's been a huge driving force for renewable adoption and this kind of shift from, uh, at least with Ethereum, moving to a proof of stake model from a proof of work model is already dramatically reducing the amount of energy necessary. That being said, things like Bitcoin that are, I believe, going to in perpetuity rely on proof of work instead of proof of stake will always be energy intensive, as well as that transition from uh, proof of work to proof of stake is going to take some time. So there are still going to be emissions and where with, you know, renewables only being around, I think, 12 to 13 percent of global energy, there's still going to be a really material footprint associated with crypto. And so the way we can actually address that is one if you're actually mining or producing NFTs or something like that, how do you actually ensure that, that your energy is coming from renewables? And if that is not possible, then it comes time to actually move to patch, where, which is a specific transaction or a specific cash block mine, et cetera. It has actually been um, resulted in some sort of negative externality, that being CO2 being emitted. And then you can actually remove it with a couple of lines of code. And the way we've typically worked with um, a broad range of either crypto companies like exchanges or companies that are trying to spin up Bitcoin ETFs, things like this, have actually we actually help them quantify the carbon intensity of that transaction and then allow them to mitigate it with um, carbon removal. The other thing that I do want to say is you have companies like the Nifty Gateway, which is a marketplace for NFTs, which was recently acquired by Gemini, already pledging to go carbon negative and choose and removing 2x its monthly carbon footprint with carbon removal. So we're already kind of beginning to see this trend. Um, and quite frankly, I, guess I find it incredibly exciting. I mean, there's already so much going for crypto. It hasn't quite crossed the chasm, in my opinion, where it's not fully mainstream yet, it's, but it's also not going anywhere. Right. It's quite clear that this is a permanent solution. And I think it would be a huge missed opportunity for any um, advocate of crypto or crypto company to both create a brand new financial instrument, but at the same time, not build it for the 21st century, but not considering the environment associated with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, in our previous insights report, we looked at embedded finance and the proliferation of APIs and building new infrastructure layers for financial services. Um, Patch sees itself as providing infrastructure for the sustainable economy. Um, so how can you, can you talk about how APIs are enabling this vision? Yeah, absolutely. It really comes down to activation energy and overhead with running a program, truthfully. 
So the beautiful thing with um, both APIs as well as any sort of so piece of software is that it automates something for you and puts it, puts it on autopilot, if you will. And so if you believe in a world where any negative externality associated with the transaction should be mitigated for you, which is one that I want to believe in. So I actually believe the average um, person doesn't have time to worry about the environment in a really meaningful way where, you know, they have rent to pay, they have to take care of their children, they have their job, there's all, they have all this stuff going on in their lives. The last thing they need to do is like go at the end of the day and like either guilt trip themselves on like, oh, wow, I spent, um, you know, I had my carbon footprint was massive because I bought the, the kids hamburgers or I did this other thing or I, I had to fly to see my mom and I, there was a, I had to do whatever ticket I had to take. Anyway, I actually think this like level of um, almost like guilt and putting it on the consumer is actually not really right. And the way to get around that is embed it in the existing user flows they already use today. So what Patches API enables is as you book a flight or as you swipe your credit card or buy something online or, or ride share to some location, um, there's an opportunity to offset or compensate that negative externality with that transaction for you by default or automatically, where a lot of people are quite willing to either pay the additional 10, 15, 20 cents to a dollar um, if it actually means it's both value aligned as well as they don't actually have to put a meaningful amount of effort in some other experience or actually maybe sacrifice something that's going on in their life. The thing that's going on behind the scenes as well here is businesses should actually be actively working to decarbonize. Um, that being said, in the event where that's not possible, Bridge can really act as that gap. One of the things that I found really interesting um, while I was working on the insights report of which you guys will be featured was the difference between carbon reduction and removal uh, with patch focused on the latter. Can you talk a bit more about this difference, negative emission tech and the growing network for carbon removal, removal projects globally? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I actually think of this in terms of there's three major buckets. There's the idea of emission reductions, which is what the business or individual should be doing themselves. So I, you know, I'm driving a car. How do I replace that with an electric vehicle? Or we do a lot of business travel. How do we fly less? The way you decarbonize a business in general is actually incredibly bespoke to that business. And so Patch is really trying our best not to get involved with that and helping the businesses focus on that internally, where they're going to focus on decarbonization. They know how their business operates the best. When you come to the end of that, that decarbonization exercise, there's still going to be some amount of emissions remaining. Whether that's a lot or a little is going to depend on the business and the maturity of their environmental or sustainability effort. And then it comes down to the, what are called uh, carbon avoidance offsets or carbon removal or negative emissions tech. And that's kind of where that decision is or decision point is. With carbon avoidance, what's actually happening is you are paying someone to prevent them from causing some sort of pollution somewhere else. And so an example of that might be a carbon offset project that ha that's associated with prevented deforestation. So you might have a forest and if that forest, it becomes deforested, there's less carbon removal associated with it. You know, the, the trees are no longer there and they're no longer sequestering carbon. And so you're actually paying someone to not cut down that forest. The problem with that is that there are these concerns related to either additionality, which is if you actually pay that $5 not to cut down that particular tree, was that tree going to be cut down in the first place at all? So what's the counterfactual outcome? So if you had someone saying, oh, please pay me to not cut down this forest, if that option had not even existed at all, would they have cut that forest down? And it becomes incredibly difficult to verify whether or not the verify the additionality of the counterfactual scenario. Um, in the case of carbon removal, this is actually saying there's already carbon in the atmosphere or in the carbon cycle, and we are actually going to take it out of that. And so an example of this is a direct air carbon capture, where these are essentially... Usually it's forced air. So you have large fans forcing ambient air through some sort of solvent. That solvent actually catches the CO2. So the CO2 stays behind and pure oxygen and nitrogen come out the other side. And then once you have that pure CO2, you can do something with it. So you can either turn it into a carbonate, which is like an inert rock or mineral, or you can inject it underground. And that carbon has now effectively been removed. I feel like climate initiatives are really seeing a resurgence right now and climate fintech can really be seen in its infancy. Um, so what are you most excited for um, in the, as you see the sector grow and um, at patch over the next year? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing we like saying internally is the, the trope, at least within, within, within startups and growth stage startups over the last 
five or 10 years is every company is a fintech company uh, where, you know, every company has some sort of like financial product you can layer on. We actually believe the next iteration of that is every company is a quote unquote climate company where this is going to be a default that's built in to the infrastructure of any business, whether it's e-commerce, fintech, travel, where, again, going back to that point I was making before, whenever there's some sort of unavoidable carbon emission, whether you're, when you're participating in commerce, that's actually compensated for you. Now, does that mean you're actually a quote unquote climate company? I don't really, it, probably not. But at the end of the day, it's going to kind of be built into the fabric of every business, much like financial tools or, or institutions are today. To close out today's interview, can you talk a bit more about your entrepreneurial journey up until this point, closing a $4.6 million seed round from Andreas and Horowitz, and finally your top three tips for fintech entrepreneurs in the market? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, at the end of the day, anyone starting a business should really caveat any other advice they hear. Um, I've only been doing this for a little bit over a year. My experience is going to be different from many other people. So at the end of the day, it might not be super broadly applicable. That being said, um, I think kind of thing number one, you always want to understand both like macro trends on where things are actually heading as well as hear from kind of concrete use cases from whether you're whoever you're selling to, whoever your ideal buyer is. That being said, what we've noticed at Patch is that there's actually a lot of gut driven decision making. When you're in your early, early days going from zero to one, a lot of people really like relying on data almost as a crutch to say like, okay, what's, you know, let's do an A-B test here or a market study there, et cetera. But at the end of the day, until you actually have someone in a room and they're prepared to, um, you know, quote unquote, sign on the dotted line, if you will, if you're a B2B business or, you know, have a consumer actually sign up and interact with your application, whatever that might be, it's kind of, it's really quite difficult to actually know with a high, really high degree of certainty what's going to work out and what's not. And so at the end of the day, you're going to have to experiment and kind of lead with your gut sometimes. When you're become a much larger business and you have like an N of, you know, a million or, or 500 million or whatever it might be, it's super easy to be data driven. But when you're going zero to one, it's actually incredibly difficult. Um, kind of second tip is, is really resilience. I mean, at the end of the day, you only need, going back to the interesting point, you only need one yes to actually, if you actually believe you're a venture back full business, I mean, patch, pitched like tens and tens of um, adventure firms. We were founded in the middle of COVID. And so you can imagine how that looks like, like actually investing in a climate business when there is effectively a global recession taking place uh, and a global pandemic. Um, so that's a pretty audacious move. And in a lot of cases, you know, 90, 90% of at least venture capitalists won't really have the appetite for that kind of risk, despite being in a really high risk business. So you really only need one yes um, it's a bit of a roller coaster emotionally. And so uh, making sure you, you kind of can keep level, not getting too high off the highs or too low off the lows. Um, and then finally, I, I forget exactly where I heard this from, um, but there's this expression of both you want to look at the immediate next problem in front of you. So, you know, what is the next, the, what is the thing that's going to kill you in the next like one, two or three months? And then where are you trying to head in five years, but not wasting any time in the middle piece, because it's actually incredibly difficult to understand where, where is Pat's going to be in one, two or three years. That being said, you really know what your North Star goal is five years out, as well as you really know, like, what's the thing that's going to like, that's keeping you up, up at night tonight. And so really focusing on those two problems and having a, cl a clarity on both how you're going to fix that immediate pain, as well as where are you heading, the midterm stuff at least in my experience, hasn't been super useful worrying about. I've been wrong almost every time on like, if you asked me, you know, six months ago, if fintech was going to be a huge use case for us, I would have told you no, and I was wrong. Um, and so, you know, keeping in mind that like the absolute short term and long term are probably the most important windows of time to focus on as, as, a, as an early founder. Yeah, that's great advice. I, I think I, I try to use that in my personal life as well, just like managing, you know, personal goals. So I can see how entrepreneurs, you know, looking at the immediate problem and then also looking where you want to go is, is really the way to approach, you know, your roadmap and where you want your company to go. Yeah, the, the one thing I will say, um, and it's really, really hard to believe this, um, hearing this as someone on the outside of a company. And I heard this a million times and I never believed it, but every startup that you think is doing great 
or absolutely crushing it is an absolute mess on the inside. I promise you, I heard this two years ago from a bunch of founders. I did not believe them. And it's not until I was on the inside that I saw how broken everything was and how much praise we were getting from the outside being at telling us how we were crushing it and everything was going incredibly well, but I feel like everything's on fire all the time. And so uh, it is true. If you've heard this feedback before, it is true as someone who's recently gone through the transition from the outside to the inside, it is hundred percent true. Uh, you're probably doing a better job than you think. So just hang in there. And uh, yeah, go go make the world incrementally better. Nice. Thank you so much, Brennan, for joining us and for sharing that advice um, for all the entrepreneurs in our community. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for our insights report and please visit our website at rise.barclays. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe via your favorite podcast app, leave us a review, and please share with your colleagues, clients, partners, and friends, and we will catch up with you in the next episode. Thank you.